Welcome to another episode of Shift with Elena Agad. In this episode, I chat with a friend and a colleague in the field of learning and development, Jordana Cole. We dove deep into the evolving job landscape and the critical role technology plays in it. We also discussed the shift from specialized roles to valuing broader skill sets. Think of it as becoming your own Swiss army knife in the workforce. Both of us stressed the significance of being adaptable and lifelong learners, especially with the rapid integration of AI into our workplaces. Embracing change and fostering a diverse skill set isn't just an advantage, it is a necessity these days. So if you're interested in this topic and look at how you can maintain your relevance, check it out and let me know what you think. Hello, friend. Hello. Part two, here we go. All right, so we are going to keep it super going with the flow, which I usually try to do with every episode. But um, um, as we were kind of just chatting right before we started recording, you know, there's so much happening in the world of work right now. And part of it, I think, is my own personal reflection as well as I observe certain things. So, you know, just a disclaimer, like I'm probably speaking from my own experiences uh, as we move forward, but there's also some some real statistics around like layoffs and and so on. So I want to talk a little bit, but let's just start with the layoffs. And the reason I say this is because I, every time that I hop on LinkedIn, I see somebody with a green little circle uh, open for work. By the way, don't recommend it. I don't recommend it. Tell, you know, I did a whole episode about why I don't recommend it, uh, the open to work circle. But it literally, I was like, I like every day I hop on on LinkedIn, there's a new person that is, you know, uh, open for work, yet unemployment is supposed to be really low and supposed to be there's a lot of jobs. So what do you think? What's happening? Yeah, what do you see? Ooh, I'm seeing the same thing. And I think, you know, it, it's hard because the psychology education in me is like, okay, I I need to look at it. And I need to also recognize that there's a bias factor there and also understand kind of what's going on. So I like you, I'm seeing that all over the place. Um, I'm seeing it in my LinkedIn, but also who is on LinkedIn, who am I connected with on LinkedIn, who are in second and third degree networks on LinkedIn. And we know that the layoff, you know, concept is hitting the tech sector a lot harder. Um, I have a lot of tech connections on LinkedIn. Um, It's also hitting, you know, I think in the HR side and L&D side hard, which is also where I have connections, right? Because we are overhead. Um, That type of role is overhead. So those are the sorts of things that are going to be hit. So of course, I'm seeing it more and more in my network, just based on who I'm connected to and what's going on in the tech sector. At the same time, it's real, right? Like, uh, you know, I, I look to even, you know, a few years ago, how things like software engineering was was the safe job, go get a computer science degree, go become a data scientist, right? And now we're seeing huge layoffs in FANGs and smaller organizations for these roles that were supposedly, you know, your, your meal ticket years ago, Mm -hmm. um, which I think is a nature of a couple of different things, but one of them is, and and I forget the actual term for it, but it's like the, it's like the monkey see monkey do (laughs) effect, right? Where you start seeing these other large organizations doing this. And it's almost, it's, it's this crowd effect that I need to do it now too. They must know something I don't know, Mm -hmm. or, you know, their their stock prices are booming. So maybe I need to do the same thing. Or if you're owned by a venture capital firm, oh, you know, we're seeing this happening in, in our portfolio. So our expectation is that this is going to happen in, you know, our other properties as well. So so I do think some of it is this crowd effect, which means that it it is hurting a lot of people. And it's it's a hard time for sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, I see, I see this as well. And it's just like, it's one of those things. And I think having been in talent development roles, I've always seen like the, you know, a lot of the, how the decisions are made around hiring and so on. So you kind of, you already have this more larger understanding around how people decisions are made in an organization. Um, And I think that now collectively, whether you're in in this role that does see this coming or not, you're starting to be like, well, you know, like, I don't know if I'm so loyal to my employer. I don't know if I can trust my employer. And fairly so. And I always say, like, it's not personal, right? Like to to each person it it is, but it's not personal from a business perspective because business is business. And it's just, it is what it is, you know? But in the case of some of these tech, you know, the stock prices are going up. I mean, the stocks are going up. 
but they're still laying people off. So it's like, maybe it's not just business, you know? So, but they're not thinking about you as a person, you know, which kind of brings me to the thought that I've had for the last at least 10 years of my career is to always have backup, you know, to always have, you know, that hobby, that, you know, alternative things that you're doing, whether, you know, it's bringing money or not, but something creative, something on the side, something that keeps you, you know, moving and going and growing and networking and all those things. Because if you're just like laser focused on your job and you're, you know, in just like any, especially large organizations, you're just a number. And that's just the reality. And I see a lot more, you know, freelance, a lot more gig work, which comes with its own challenges. And I mean, we both know it's, I, I've been there, I've done full time <laughs> on my own thing. It's hard, man. It's hard. Um, but you also start to see like a lot of that on the rise, you know what I'm saying? Or again, maybe it's my algorithm because I think I'm just like, the people I'm connected with are a lot of entrepreneurs and people that are doing their own thing and so on. So I don't know what you think about, like, have you seen the, the mood of a, of an, a, a person in a workplace changing towards like, hmm, maybe I should just like jump ship and do something else. Yeah. I think that mood has been shifting since COVID though, because people's mm-hmm. priorities started changing. Right. Um, I think there's a couple factors. I think a COVID you know, people went, gosh, you know, why am I spending, you know, as you're sitting at home, why am I spending so many of my waking hours, so much of my energy, so much extra time in work? There are other things in my life that are important to me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, particularly as people were working from home, right, that that came up quite a bit. And then I think you also have Gen Z entering the workforce, which uh, I love Gen Zers, like I love their, (laughs) their attitude that, you know, job is only one part of my life. It's not my whole life. They are actually more likely to embrace gigging and freelance work and also setting clear boundaries, which I think older generations have had struggles with in the workplace. And then I have you, you have the situation now where even to your point in the best of cultures, at the end of the day, a business is a business and a for-profit business is going to be focusing on what do I need to do to sustain, enhance profitability so that we can be on a continued trajectory for growth. And I, I think that's part of the challenge of where we are in this stage of capitalism is it's all about increasing the growth rate, increasing the profitability. It's not staying stagnant. If you plateau, you die is the kind of the, mm-hmm. the type of mentality, which means having to make tough choices in the name of profitability, which means people are hurt by that, even though to your point, it's not being done as something, you know, that's about each person, it does still feel personal. And, you know, one of the things that I also like to remind leaders of is that businesses don't operate without people. And you have to think about the long-term ramifications of making short-term business decisions on people's morale, on people's engagement, on people's anxiety, on people's aptitude for um, uh, risk tolerance, on retention, on all of that, because we aren't robots and machines who can just go and be pushed to the limits on productivity or leave the emotions aside and kind of give our best work day to day. They're all they're all entangled. And I think with all of this, people don't really feel safe anymore. Um, Mm -hmm. Even if it's just algorithmically and it is, you know, an outlier to certain sectors, which I'm on the fence whether or not that's true or not, the the mood of an individual does not feel safe. And I think one of the things that's different and, and I'm with you over, you know, in comparison to other generations is, you know, there was a time in, in, in particularly in the boomer generation where it was pretty common that you would get a job out of school, work your way up in that company, be at that company for 30 years, retire, you know, have a pension, et cetera. That is a rarity nowadays, Mm -hmm. whether, you know, a lot of companies aren't even there in 30 years, they're being acquired, they're merging, they're folding, they're pivoting, right? And now, and and I've seen this as a shift, I'm curious your take on this, right? I remember like 10 years ago, if you were moving companies or roles every two to three years, it was kind of like, what's, what's wrong with you? You're a job hopper. Now, if you're 
at a company for more than five years, it's almost like, why didn't you explore something else? And certainly if you're in a role for mm-hmm. five years time, have you seen that on, on your side? Yeah, for sure. It's uh, it's such a norm. Like, I don't think anybody even questions it anymore. Like, you know, before it's like, well, you know, that was like a big question. Like, well, that person is job hopping. Now it's like, nobody bats an eye. I feel like I, you know, nobody even pays attention. People are just like, hey, like, you, your resume looks great, you know, which is a whole other issue, right? Like a resume can look one way, but it's like, how do we actually evaluate a person? The whole other conversation. But um, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, I think people just don't, you know, and I think part of it, part of the reason that we're pushed towards this is because it's so hard to find good talent. Because people can look great on resumes, but then there's so many other things that once you're in a company, could be like soft skills, could be the generational things with Gen Zs and so on, right? Like there's so many other challenges in finding, you know, the right talent. And I, t- I attended a conference I was telling you on Tuesday, and it was all about kind of talent development and performance and so on. And, you know, collectively, literally like everybody in the room who does like talent acquisition and talent development, collectively were like, yeah, resumes are like a wash. And, uh, you know, this, the the process of recruitment is, is, is just, uh, you know, it's, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's just messed up. It's a lack of a better word. Um, it's completely, uh, a in a fi- it's, it's, it's a broken, it's a, bro- it's a, it's a broken system. And it's yeah. funny because I was like, did we all just, um, I was like, I was looking at, I was like, did we all, did, did everybody catch on? Like and there was a panel and they were like, so, and everybody kind of like nodded, like, yeah, pretty much a broken system. And I'm like, did we all just collectively admit? And you know what I mean? Uh, it's just, it's just funny because it's like, it's a broken system, but it's like, what does it take to change that? Do you know what I mean? And then, um, you know, but then being in a recruitment seat, I also understand, you know, that a lot of times you're the middle person, you're like the the middle between the hiring manager and the candidate. And your job is just hard in general. Like people don't realize like, you know, what is a recruit? I mean, a good recruiter, let's say good. There are some really crappy recruiters who are just there to make money off of you and et cetera. But, you know, recruiter actually cares to make sure you have a great career and so on. Um, it's tough to be in that seat. So like I, I emphasize with them, but, um, before I go off on a tantrum on that part. But yeah, I do see um, a huge shift in that because like nobody even questions it anymore, right? Uh, yeah. But I guess it depends on who's reading your resume as well. Maybe you still have those, you know, old school traditional people, you know, that might be uh, that might be um, still considering like how oh, you've only been with this company for two, three years and so on. So, but I think, I think collectively so. we're all moving away from that, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's the whole thing. I think loyalty goes two ways, right? Like how can you expect people to give you loyalty when you can't guarantee that they're going to have, and I mean, a job for X number of years. Now, to be fair, I don't think that guarantee has ever been there. However, the reality of, of the, the world of work today is showing that like, it's, it's like a slim chance. Uh, you know, if you're no longer uh, valuable to the organization and however they define it, you can be out the door even getting exceptional performance reviews, um, even having, you know, unique, strong skill set, being loyal, having a strong network. And and I think that's the thing that's shifted is historically and particularly in layoff periods, it was bottom performers or, you know, roles that were no longer adding value to the company. And I think that's what's different right now. That's, that's causing a lot more stress and putting up question marks is people who are being laid off, who add value to the cover company, who have had strong performance reviews, who have been in leadership roles, who have even been invested in by the organization. So it almost feels like nobody is safe. And if these individuals are safe, you know, how could I potentially be safe? And, and you're right. It is, there's, it's a broken system. I feel bad for everybody. You know, hiring managers are in, managers jobs are, we've talked about this before, becoming Mm -hmm. increasingly, increasingly complex and difficult. And you throw at it that our spans of control are increasing. The expectations for performance and delivery are increasing, right? And then we're leaning teams on top of it. And then, you know, we're replacing with offshoring, we're replacing with automation, we're replacing with AI that we're still trying to make sense of, and we're still under-investing in skilling, in talent development, in learning. It 
it is like a holistic system that, you know, it's almost like I think about infrastructure a lot and you can have the greatest person in the world, but if you don't have a strong system that's going to bring out the best in them or that system is crumbling, mm -hmm. they're, they're going to fall. And yeah. you know, I, I see a lot of this as organizational infrastructure and there's a crack in that. And, and what happens? You know, we we saw a huge disaster earlier this week, a heartbreaking disaster with the bridge falling in Baltimore, Maryland, due yeah. to the container ship hitting it. And you know, I I think that that's what the precipice of what a lot of organizations could be under in the next few years, with you know not investing in the right systems, not investing in talent, not investing in the right incentives and reward system in place and leaning, 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 it's having a very weak bridge. Yeah. But you know what else is that it's, it's all of those things that completely against excellent points. Um, and I also think a lot of these issues and, and just challenges we have at work comes to just people. And what I mean by that is politics in the workplace, drama, some just unnecessary, like, silos and the the power struggles and like for god's sakes like sometimes i'll observe a situation you know i was talking to a friend uh who works for a large organization not to be naming them but a huge organization in in business for hunting probably like a hundred a hundred years for sure yeah oh my god the shenanigans that go on in this organization and many others that i've seen and sometimes you want to and like to where people are you know they're they are um they are the the container ship on purpose they're just you know uh, uh going across different bridges killing all the bridges around them that are within the organizations right purely because of ego because yeah. of power struggles so like you can have the system in place but if culturally or the mindset of people is just not healthy for whatever reason you know it's like you know and this is and i know this is this is maybe the idealist in me but i'm like sometimes i'm like don't we all work for the same organization don't we all win if the organization wins why do we have like where do all these cliques and silos and these little mafias inside organizations happen where because it's the reality you can have there's a lot of great names a lot of big organizations sexy names all of that where comp people just want to work there and then you go in those are and you're like what like you do realize there's like you know people are dying every day and there's wars happening and there's all these different other things that are happening and you're this is this is what you chose to spend your energy on is drama at work like do you know what i'm saying and that to me is a is a is a is a more business killer management killer growth killer motivation killer than 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 anything than a system or a process because you know but that just goes to human behavior and, and that's even a more complicated topic but it's like I feel like that's that's a big thing that nobody talks about. It's like, why don't we just get all on the same page? Like, we're all just trying to make business, keep jobs, and grow. So you're hitting on, like, one of my favorite topics. And I actually think that there's there's three pieces behind this um, that I'm going to hit on. One is human nature, to your point. Um, one, and I'll I'll kind of expand on the three. So one is human nature. One is actually a problem with the system, and I'll explain that in a, in a second. And then the last is about just kind of individual stress. So, so I'll start with that one, then I'll go to human behavior, then I'll go to the system. So individual stress, as we know, the world is in a hugely uncertain time right now. There's a ton of instability, there's a ton of uncertainty, and there's a ton of fear. And when that's the case, and we don't really know how to like parcel it out, we focus on the things that we can control. And True. we we kind of spin those up into bigger things because it's actually an outlet for all of these other things that we can't process and we can't understand, which is why therapy and investing in mental health is such an important thing. And that's another- Or question. physical health. Yeah, and physical health. Yeah, <laughs> physical mental health. And that's also, again, like something that- we we don't invest in and we actually don't provide the time um, or resources yeah. for people to do that effectively. The second is human behavior. So we are social creatures. We are actually tribal creatures. Um, evolutionary, we are tribal creatures and we have, it's it's just kind of part of who we are 
in groups and out groups. And that's why you see things like clicks from, you know, childhood still manifesting in adulthood. And it's all over the place, you know, whether it's some of the challenges that we see on a big picture in, in you know, religious fighting, political fighting, right, geographical fighting. It's also what you see people spewing vitriol at each other over sports teams. Mm-hmm. And within organizations, particularly large ones, where we spend most of our time, we create tribes. And that is natural. And there will always be people within tribes who have, you know, whether it's focused on helping the community and they're doing it for that reason, or it's focused on advancing their own desires and it's doing it for that reason. And then that gets us to the system. I actually think that the system at the end of the day incentivizes that. So to the point that you brought up, if if the system wasn't broken, then the system would not tolerate behavior like that. It wouldn't Mm. be enough for somebody to be performing at a certain level, the behaviors that they exhibit impact the performance and the success of the company. And we wouldn't accept toxic high performers. We wouldn't go, well, you know, so-and-so is a jerk. Yeah, he's impossible to deal with, but he brings in, he's the highest salesperson and brings in all these revenues. So just learn to deal with him. Mm -hmm. But there are too many cultures that embrace that. So it's it's a system that's creating those politics and those jerks. And even in places where they try and weed that out, I think the way that as organizations, we set goals is problematic and actually creates this internal tribal warfare. So if you think about how goals are set within an organization, they're often cascaded, right? Functionally, mm-hmm. set your big objectives at the top, board, C-suite, then you know each of those C-suite leaders takes that, distills that down to their next level, gets distilled, distilled, distilled. So what's happening is you have teams that are setting goals, that are setting KPIs, functionally by silo. And then they set them. Does it ladder up? Yep. Looks good. Is it something that we can accomplish? Does it make sense for this year for the outcomes we're looking to create? Absolutely. Then other team over here does it, but they never look across. And what happens is those goals are in conflict with each other. Mm -hmm. I think about like, you know, salespeople and uh, customer success people, you know, hunters and the relationship nurturers, especially in tech companies, right? If you go out, if you're, if your goal is about bringing in new revenue and you'll do whatever it takes to get there and over promise. And then on the flip side, your mm-hmm. goal over here is to meet implementation get guidelines and is to get high cu- client satisfaction rates and high renewal rates. And you know that the salesperson over here is promising something that you can absolutely not deliver on. That is going to create tension. That's going to create tribalism. That's going to create politicking, up and overing, and and just drama. So I think that while it's part of human nature, we could actually reduce some of the drama if we got better at intentionally designing the system to not only disincentivize the bad behavior, but to actually you know, say, if you exhibit this, you're, you're no longer a part of this company, or you won't get your bonus. And to make sure that we're not increasing tribalism in the way that we operate. Yeah, you see, uh, you see, I start with like, a, uh, a event, and then you just structure it in a perfect three little baskets, which is what I love about having this conversation with you. No, you're you are spot on. I think you're very kind uh, in in some of your observations. So I appreciate that because I'm like, just get your shit together. Like, do not bring your drama to work. Do do not show your manhood at work. Do not show your you know power trip at work because things at home are going badly or because the world is falling apart. Like, let's you know what I mean. Like, learn to dissect your emotions between uh, being a professional at work and working on the same mission and the same team and so on so so but yeah I you're 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 much uh, more empathetic than I am on that side of things so I, I, I it does make sense from the human nature how much we're impacted by a lot of external things and it's like that's your outlet like that's where you you can't control that's where you can throw in the power trip you know but it's like really you know what I'm saying like I get it but it's I get it but I don't you yeah. know, um, so but that just speaks to character and um and behavior and all of that, which is a uh, so complex and 
Uh, I'm far from a perfect human being. I never will be. So I'm sure I have my moments. But um, but I think if we just start with awareness, and I think if we just check that at the door when we go into a place and say like we're here for the main for the same thing and so on, a lot of conflict can be invo- avoided in workplaces. And you mentioned a point earlier, like people just don't feel safe, and I think or they don't trust the company. And I think the least we can do as employers is to create a the best atmosphere we can, the best environment and provide mentorship, provide some kind of growth. So even if a person is only with us for one, two, three years, they have the best experience because those are the people that are your ambassadors. Uh, you know, what goes around comes around. I'm a true believer in that. You know what I mean? So just being a good manager, being a manager who cares, being a leader who cares will serve you long after that person is gone they're going to you never know where they end up they can bring you more business they might boomerang back and come back and be an employee again there's so much value to it and i think if we just at least if we focus on that if we just say like how can we create the best experience for that person while they're with us nobody guarantees anything but you know i guarantee you as an employee i'm going to give you the i'm going to give you the best of me because i want to learn i want to grow and as an employer I'm going to make sure to create the best learning environment for you because that's what we're here to. And at least during that duration, however short or long that person's there, they're operating at top productivity. Yeah. You know I mean, mean so kudos. Yeah. And, and I would, and, but the thing is there are so rare organizations that actually share that. Right. I think yeah. from that going out and flat out saying, and I mean, you know, at will employment in the U S is, is a common thing. Right. And, but saying, look, I can't guarantee that you'll have a job for X number of years, but what I can promise is that I will help provide a great experience for you while you're here. Now, in order to do that, we need to meet each other, right? Like I will contribute to you if you are contributing back to the organization and Mm -hmm. and let's have a conversation of what that looks like and, and, and what that means for you. And if there's something that you ask for that I can't provide for whatever reason, we'll figure out other things that can get you what you need, or we'll kind of set the parameters up front of what that might actually look like. But I, I think so few leaders are equipped to have that conversation. And I think organizations are scared because they're scared of overpromising and undeliver and under delivering to employees. But you're right. Like You know, there's so many ways I I think of like your employees and alums of your organization, they can either be like your street team who's Mm -hmm. out there, you know, drumming up excitement for you, or they can be your trolls, right? Like who are, who are out there bashing you everywhere, telling people to stay away from you. And what are you doing to create more of that street team experience? And it can't be enough that you're like, well, we provide all of these things because I think that's often what happens. We provide all of these things or, you know, we we handled the layoff in a way where you were taken care of for a few months. We have to pay attention to what people care about, what they individually need. And that's a really hard and time consuming thing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, it's like, as an organization, I think this, because I, I like in, in my practice, whether as a recruiter, as a talent person, sometimes maybe, you know, obviously, I'm very transparent, and I'm mindful, obviously, of the level of transparency. But I don't think I'd like over the years that I'm doing this, I don't think I've ever had something that I couldn't share like you know what I'm saying like in terms of like I couldn't be honest with somebody or in the recruitment process I will tell you exactly why you didn't make the cut if you and I have had a conversation I have no issues telling you exactly why I didn't make the cut and I think you know even in talent development conversations right with management higher ups parallel uh, you know people that are kind of coming up behind me I feel like honesty is the best policy in a lot of cases, not all, maybe, maybe, I don't know. I'm just, I'm I'm not going to say it's all true across board, but I think being transparent is a safer way just to say, I don't know. I don't know if I'll be able to provide this for you, you know, but it's like companies, a lot of companies like, well, no, that's our image. And we can't say that. And I'm sure there's a set of HR policies that I'm not aware of that, that stop you from saying X, Y, and Z. But I'm just saying, like, just as a manager, like saying, like, listen, this is the reality. This is where instead of promising the moon, because I don't think that motivates people like it's, you know, what I'm saying, because then after a while, if you promise the moon and you don't even get it to uh, to to the sky, like eventually people that's going to be a turnoff. So, like, why not be honest up front to an extent? Right. Like, I mean, there's certain sensitive information, so et cetera, et cetera. There's obviously there's caveats to it. 
But um, I think that's what we miss. And I think part of it is because people feel uncomfortable because we are psychologically wired to want to, you know, help and maybe to give good news and be positive. But sometimes it's not like that. And I think a lot of managers are afraid to have these conversations. A lot of hiring managers, a lot of recruiters, um, they don't want to tell somebody this is why you didn't make it or this is why, you know, X, Y, and Z. So I don't know. I think if we just you know, again, maybe that's the idealist in me, but I just feel like it's so much more simpler than we make it out to be. So now you're going to be, the, now you're going to be the kind one, because I think that the truth is we live in a very litigious society and we live in a very recording happy society. Mm. So it means that your delivery of communication has to be perfect, particularly when you are in a situation where the news is hard, the news is bad. Um, or you're not getting something. Uh, and, and I think that people need, like there is this desire, well, we shouldn't provide too much because we need to protect ourselves because anything that we do provide could potentially be used um, in a litigious manner or, you know, naming and shaming on Reddit. You know, somebody yeah, posts, like, this is what I got back or, or recording that conversation. And then, I mean, we've seen stuff go viral, right? And yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's almost like it's it's such an interesting thing where I think we're losing sight of the humanity on both sides, right? Where you know employees feel like I'm not being cared for as a human being, like I'm just a number, and at the same time we expect you know organizational leaders, we expect uh, recruiters, we expect hiring managers to be infallible, perfect in their delivery every single time. And we see them as almost like statues of an organization mm -hmm. rather than human beings. And I and I think I think we need to infuse a little more humanity in business in, in both ways. And I think that's becoming harder as we rely more and more on technology and in, in replacing humans. And I and I think there's look, I use AI. I'm a fan of AI. Um, and I also recognize that there are AI is being taught on human behavior. So it's mm -hmm. it's really fascinating where I think we might almost infuse more humanity accidentally through technology uh, than in just really being human to human to each other. Uh, you don't get me started on AI. I love it. Um terrified of it all at the same time. Yep. I I mean I, I let's that's a good good pivot to to the AI chat. Yeah. Um I I, love, I mean I love, I'm using so many different tools for podcasting, for repurposing of content, for I mean just like brainstorming. It's it's phenomenal. The, yesterday I was studying for I was taking a certification this morning, and um, I was I, I had in this uh, platform I was using it would literally quiz me. So I had a chat with AI and it was like quizzing me. And it's like do you want to try another question? And it would ask me a question. I would give an answer. And as long as I'm kind of giving it like a sort you know eighty percent correct, they'd be like yep. Just you need to add this. So it was like a tutor. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? It was like a tutor that was an expert in talent development and knew exactly like every everything that I needed to know for this exam. Um, that's just been um, like, it's, I was like, this is just amazing. Like, I don't, do you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like having a tutor, which, you know, is scary in part, one part because of we're in talent development, we're in consultant roles. Like, can AI be a consultant? Like, you know, solving talent development problems in the future? I mean, even now, probably. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? So it's like, where do we stand? So like, I'm excited for it, but I'm also mindful, like, how do I pivot myself? So I'm curious, what is it that you're doing? Like, what? how are you observing this and preparing and so on? Yeah, I love the the word that you use tutor. Um, because I I I see I see AI as a as kind of an assistant in a couple of ways. Like one, it's great for, you know, the checks and balances. So that idea of a tutor in, in the way that you describe, like, hey, you know, what am I missing in this? Hey, like what would make this answer stronger? Um, you know, take a look at this and help me, you know, synthesize it into X, Y, and Z give me the top five bullet points, right? I think it's also really great as the starting point on a blank page. Uh, so many people struggle when knowing when to get started, whether it's a plan, goal setting, writing a, a an article, designing a deck, right? Like I don't mm -hmm. even, and that, that barrier of getting started, once you get going, it's a lot easier. And where I yeah. think it can help is a place to get you started, not create the whole thing, but yeah. get you started. And then from there, you're able to actually, you know, uh, put your creative spin, put your flavor, change things and, and really get focused and spend the time 
on that. And it, it's funny because when you were talking about like recruiting, right? And I was thinking about, you know, part of the part of the challenge with the system now is, you know, the resumes and cover letters are going to basically be entirely written by AI, you know, pretty soon, right? So is is that even a helpful tool? But at the end of the day, to your point, it's still the human that's doing the work. And I think that's the call out. And I think that's also because I've had a conversation of like, can AI replace coaches? And I think an AI can be a good coaching assistant to help prompt an individual with reminders between coaching sessions. I think an AI could be a good consultant in analyzing data um, Mm -hmm. and uh, helping to create those plans. But at the end of the day, we aren't in a place where the people don't do the work where you as the person don't do the work. You don't do the integration of the, of the coaching. You don't do the process. You don't do the critical thinking. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's the piece that AI doesn't have right now. Right. It's, it's the critical thinking piece. And I think, I don't think it's going to replace fully consultants. I think what it will do is be an assistant to a consultant to help, you know, maybe take all that data and synthesize it, but then allow that consultant to take the insights more quickly and their aptitude of the organization, their interpersonal interactions to then make, you know, those critical thinking and strategic recommendations and really having that human to human interaction to get that motivation and and progress on it. Mm. Yeah, no, I tend to, yeah, I, I guess I can kind of see, see that, um, I think we still probably need that human touch, but again, like how, for how long, that's the question, right? Like it's, uh, it's like, uh, for how long? And what's interesting is that, um, I don't know if you saw this, I'm sure you did, there was a, a P research, P O P P W, whatever, however you say it, I don't yeah, never know how, yeah, to, uh, yeah. whatever, I don't never know how to say that. Um, a research that came out that said, in, interestingly enough, and we start talking about this in the beginning, it's the software developers, it's the coders that, that are getting impacted, it's people who have bachelor's degrees or higher, that are sitting in cushy corporate jobs that are getting impacted. It's not the people on, like, it's not the UPS drivers, right? right? Like, it's not the truck drivers, it's not the people working in right. services, in a lot of the services and so on. So like some some services, yes, becoming more, um, you know, taken up by AI, but there's a lot of jobs that are still, um, you know, and, and those jobs, and they were saying like percentage wise, AI is impacting more bachelor holders than high school degree holders. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And it's it's pretty interesting because like, like you were saying, like to be a computer scientist was like, wow, it was a thing. Now it's like like now you have all the low code, no code, and now you have AI. It went from like coding to low code, no code to now AI. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, right? Yeah. And I think, I think that's one of the things that is, uh, hmm, now what happens? So look, we don't know, right? Like, yeah, we don't know. Just It's yeah. operating so quickly. And, you know, the thing that I keep coming back to is A, human beings are resilient. <laughs> and B, like there are jobs that are, standard, you know, like top field jobs today that didn't even exist 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. There are jobs that existed 40 years ago, huge careers that have become completely obsolete because of technology. And then there's a ton of things in between. And that's going to continue. So if you look at 40 years ago, telephone operators, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Typists, right? Like they were, I mean, everywhere. And those jobs have become obsolete. Now people learned new skills and kind of that adapted into different ways, right? And things like social media manager, (laughs) you know, even data scientists, right? Those were things that didn't really exist 20 plus years ago, right? And now they are pervasive. So, So there will be, will there be jobs that will go away and become obsolete? For sure. Will there be new jobs that come up as a result of this that we can't even fathom or imagine right now? Absolutely. Will and that those are kind of the bookends of your bell curve. And then in the middle, will jobs be impacted? Whether they'll have new responsibilities or you know, slightly different responsibilities, expectations, and skills, a hundred percent. Now, the thing that is interesting is so much of I think of the focus on like upskilling, reskilling has been in those kind of you know, high school um graduates, you know, more of uh, whether it's kind of um, lower wage roles um, in upskilling to some of these more tech savvy type of roles. 
And I think now what we're experiencing is those tech savvy roles are some of the places where reskilling needs to happen. But because they've been put to such standards of pay, because they've been put to such standards of like esteem, benefits, incentives, that's a that's a complete it's like flipping the poles on the planet. Mm-hmm. Like it shakes everything up. And there are so many domains right now that we need people in that we need to reskill people in that if we don't, we're going to have some huge issues like teaching, like medicine, nursing, doctors, pilots, that we are still in a world that requires people. But what is going to, you know, incentivize somebody in a, in a tech role who's been you know, in a fang company making $350,000, $400,000 a year, working from home, nice setup, nice benefits, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. flexibility, lots of vacation to, you know, even working alone and, and, and also, you know, great for neurodiversity. Could somebody like that go into a school district where they're, you know, expected to make less than a third of the salary that they were making, get certification, get higher education, mm-hmm. be in a classroom with 30 students every day of, of mm-hmm. ages and managing. The answer is no. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's not like, happening. It's not happening, right? Yeah. So what do we do? Like all the yeah. focus has been, and, and it's been like that word even upskilling. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, what ha- what do you think happens? Elena, what do you think happens here? I don't know. I can tell you what I'm trying to do. I can tell you how I'm trying to stay afloat of all this. And I'm curious how you stayed just for the, you know, for those that are listening, in case you were wondering what two career talent development professionals are doing to maintain their talent development (laughs) progress. Um, For me, I'm uh, continuously connecting and learning uh, for people like yourself, of course, and, and so many others that think continually networking and building because we don't know what's going to happen we don't know where it's going to look like but you know what has always worked at least for centuries is relationships uh continuing growth continuing learning taking care of yourself taking care of your body taking care of your mind everything else is figure outable as somebody says i forget the girl who says it the woman (laughs) now it's like everything else is figure outable and that's how i live my life like as long as i'm healthy my mind is still there and i'm still etc and i have access and so on, everything else is figure outable. But what drives, um, I think, success in life is relationships and just being curious. And um, because you don't, I, I don't, I genuinely don't know. And I do, I am concerned and I just continue to do things I enjoy. And, um, and, and my health is my priority always. And then, you know, just trying to live life and, you know, continue to learn. That's it. Like whatever that looks like. And that looks different every week. Yeah. What I, are you I doing? Love- I love that relationships, a hundred percent, a hundred percent, percent. again, social creatures. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I think the cool thing about the world that we're in now is our tribes don't have borders. Right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, create tribes. I, you know, I have all these mini tribes that I'm a part of for, and communities from all across the globe, from different interests that I have from, you know, working with people in different places from alumni mm-hmm. networks. Right. There's, which is so cool. Right. Like I can create my own communities. I'm with you too about like that. And for me, it's about growth and creating, right? Like I am somebody who continuously likes to grow. I'm somebody who likes to help other people grow. Mm -hmm. And I'm somebody who likes to create. And I think there's there's a couple of things that, you know, I've been doing. I'm an entrepreneur now. I have been for a year and that's that's scary, right? Um, And a couple of things that I think have served me well during this time is one, um, I have a diversified skill set. Uh, I'm a coach. I'm a facilitator. I'm a consultant. I'm a you know learning designer, right? Uh, and I'm a strategist. Um, and it's interesting because I've had people ask me, "Well, if you could only do one, which one would you do?" And I'm like, "No, exactly." No, thank you. People no, ask me that all. Yeah, right? they'll be like, "What do you need to let go? Of? What do you... none no. none of it? No. I want to do all of it. I want to do all of it." And yeah. I um I think about musical theater. And there's a concept in musical theater called you have to be a triple threat to be a musical theater. You need to sing, you need to dance, and you need to act. Mm. You have to be able to do all three. So I like to think about what I do as the triple threat of development, right? I, I can and I like doing all of those things. Now, that also means 
that I'm approaching my business in that way, where, you know, I see my business as an investment and it, you know, smart investors diversify their portfolio. Yeah. So if I have all of my efforts in one thing, say one-to-one coaching, what happens when that dries up? I have, I have a problem. So, you know, I'm kind of, and because I have different interests, I'm able to do that because I have different skills. I'm Mm -hmm. able to do that where I kind of diversify my offerings. Um, I diversify what I create. I diversify even how I do my business, whether it's through my own clients, through partnerships, through subcontracting. So if I run into a situation where one isn't providing the returns and by returns, I'm not just talking about financial returns. I'm also talking about energetic returns. Mm -hmm. Returns, growth returns that I can pivot and put more effort into one of those other areas. But that means I had to get skilled in those areas. That mm-hmm. means I have to continue to skill in those areas. And part of that is experimenting. So mm-hmm. I think a lot of people want to wait. Um, there's there's a there's something called um the diffusion of innovation, and it's common in, in technology. So, you know, imagine that, you know, there's a new iPhone released. There's a bell curve of when human beings uh, adopt to that. You've got two to 3% are your, your early adopters. They're the people who are sleeping outside the Apple store, <laughs> wanting to be the first people in line to get that phone. Never me. Never me either. <laughs> then You've got your like 10% or sorry, those are your innovators, innovators. Um, Then you've got your 10% that are your early adopters. They're the people who um, are pre-ordering it. They want to be one of the first people to get it. They're going to create the unboxing videos, but they're happy for it to show up at their house. They are not sleeping outside or waiting in line at the app store, right? Then you've got your early majority. So this is about a third of people. Your early majority are people who are waiting to start to hear kind of reviews for some friends or some influencers they trust, seeing those unboxing photos, and then they're going to buy it. Then you have the late majority. Those are people who, another third, are waiting till, okay, there's a deal at Verizon now where I can get $200 off my phone, um, you know, or- that's you. Yep. Or I, or, or like, eh, my phone's starting to get real slow. It's time to upgrade it. Mm-hmm. Then you've got your laggards. And those are like still about 15% of the population, which are the screen is busted. You need to turn <laughs> on and off your phone with a paper clip. And they were like, I will use this phone until it literally won't turn on anymore or the, or it will no longer be supported and you cannot do anything to take it away from me. Now, I use the analogy of the phone, but it's true with AI right now. And anytime we have any new technological Mm -hmm. advancement and what I can say is do your darndest to be an early adopter, play with it, experiment with it, learn it. And I think that's one of the nice things of, you know, if you are concerned and you're in a corporate job right now. Use that as space to maybe you don't need to do a side hustle. Maybe you don't have the flexibility to do it. You know, things are go. Everybody's family and lifestyles are different and you might not have the freedom to do that. Right. Or, you know, you might not want to turn your hobby into a job because it might kill the love for you in it. Your hobby might be a respite. But what you can do is experiment with things. Get curious. Hmm, I'm going to see how I can use it in this. I'm going to try. I'm going to learn more about this thing. It doesn't mean that you have to go all in on it. Take yeah. an experimental mindset. And that's what being an early adopter of AI is. And, and frankly, that's what's helped me in my career and move move up. That's helped me pivot industries. And it's what gave me the confidence to be able to become an entrepreneur in this time. Mm-hmm. I love that. I love that. And uh, for people who are listening, like, well, I don't have time to experiment. I always say, you know, it's uh, you're going to be left behind. That's how that's how I look. If you are not making time to do the things that you just mentioned, you're just going to be left behind. Facts like it's just it's your choice. It's OK. But it's like, you know, it's same thing with health. If you don't invest in your health now, you're going to be associated where you have to invest in it. And it's going to be probably more costly, more impactful on your life and so on. So early adopters. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I think, I think I'm an early adopter when it comes to AI, just not the iPhone, uh, <laughs> but, um, or, or, or other like kind of, you know, gadgets and stuff yeah. like that. But, um, no, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. I think it's, I, I think it's an excellent point. Um, and, and I think it's just, yeah, that that's all we can do at the moment. You know what I mean? Like, that's just the best, you know, like, unless somebody knows the future, 
Um, you know, in which case, please come on my podcast and tell me all about it. <laughs> but otherwise, it's just the best thing. And funny enough, you were talking about the different um, skill set. Uh, our mutual contact, Matthew Daniel, he recommended the book Ranch, okay. David Epstein. It talks about how generalists, so people who were, who were able to do different things are going to be kind of ruling. And I see it so much. And in my case, like having been an entrepreneur before and even just in my corporate roles now, I can see so much of just being a generalist because I was never like super smart in one area. So I was always just like curious and like experimenting and became very kind of diverse and and, and with the things I can do. And honestly, I feel like that's half the reason I have a career is because I'm, I have a range of skills as the book says. So it's, yeah. um, yeah, it's, uh, it's an excellent book for those. So for those that are listening and not watching, it's called range by David Epstein. So yeah. It's a great, um, it's a great, it's such a good call. And I think for, the, and I think this is where the shift is happening for the past, you know, 20, 30 years, we've been taught that we have to specialize. Mm -hmm. Like you have to become a specialist in X craft, like even take, take software engineers, you have to specialize in this coding language and become yeah. a subject matter expert in this coding language. And I think about, because it's, it's not about just like knowing a little bit about a lot of stuff. I think the truth on that is being skilled in you know complementary areas or a bunch of different areas and i, I yeah. kind of think about like the true epitome of of range is being like a swiss army knife mm -hmm. that you are this tool that can be pulled out in a multiple a multitude of different situations and can lean on different skills depending on what the situation is. And that's also going to free you up for more of that gig work too, um, so that you're not restricted to just kind of putting all of your talents into one thing. And then if that one thing goes away, you're just searching for a replacement of that one thing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, great conversation as always. Speaking of health and all that, I have hot yoga to get to. So I'm going to wrap this up, but we're going to do part three and four and many more. Uh, <laughs> at some point, we're going to do it in person whenever I become an early adopter of uh, in per the, 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 the equipment that I have has been sitting there for like two months now. Um, it will happen. Um, but yeah, so it's been a pleasure as always. Thank you so much for the conversation and we will chat again soon. Sounds good.